So um, I'm David Ng. Um, I, I've learned from coming to Japan. This is my 11th time to Japan. So I've uh, learned that uh, good Japanese presentations always start with an apology. <laughs> uh, so I apologize for my presentation because I, I handed in the manuscript for my dissertation two weeks ago uh, for the first time. So it's under review, and some of it trickles over into this topic. Uh, the topic that I was guided um, to talk about was moving towards artificial intelligence, these sorts of things. So uh, the bottom half of this title, um, where we're talking about Internet of Things, cloud platforms, and cognitive computing, um, I'm going to make the assumption, I hate to say that because Gary's in the audience, that uh, this is a non-technical audience, and so I'll try to make things clear about what um, these technologies are. Um, the top part on innovation learning and open sourcing is what my dissertation topic is about. So I'm gonna touch into that a little bit uh, because the, uh, as I was having more conversations with Gary and sending email back and forth to Gucci-san and Professor Kijima, it's kind of like, okay, we're having these discussions and uh, the dissertation ideas are impinging, particularly around the idea of open sourcing. Uh, most people would call it open source, and I'll soon explain why I call it open sourcing, because I see it much more as a behavior. So I'm going to make three assertions in this presentation. I'm really only going to say three things, okay? uh, and uh, I'll break them down. But the first one is that open innovation learning, which is actually the name of my dissertation, um, through open sourcing or private sourcing has grown from 2001 to become mainstream. So my study uh, is of seven cases at IBM, starting in 2001, when IBM started doing open source things. Uh, for those of you who have read the book Open Innovation by Henry Chesborough, IBM is one of the cases that is there. And so um, Hank Chesborough knows a lot about open innovation and wrote about it at IBM. I was working at IBM at that time. And so the, the thing that I find about talking about open innovation, when you look at the strategy community that looks at it, it's kind of like they declare, do open innovation, and then it's like, oh, success. But what I've been doing, my, my study is of uh, IBM between 2001 and 2011. It took five or six years for IBM to figure out how to work with open sourcing in a commercial environment. Because it's really not straightforward. Um, I use the term <coughs> open sourcing and contrast it to private sourcing. From a systems perspective, the question essentially is, are you allowed to see the system in terms? Or are they hidden? So Gary was talking about a black box. Any black box is what I would call private sourcing. So the question of open sourcing while private sourcing, doing both simultaneously, had IBM actually contributing to open source communities. At the same time, it is selling a product to customers for a lot of money. Now, way, stop and think about this. You take something that is free and you sell it to a customer that wants it. And they pay a lot of money. This is a pretty good business. And uh, IBM has have done that. Uh, they're still doing it. Uh, they've extended it. Uh, companies like uh, Google are doing this sort of thing, open source community. So let me talk a little bit about um, this is the, the, the big outline for the dissertation. Um, so I have this history of open source while private sourcing, 2001 to 2011. And that is um, seven cases plus the context. Um, I have to apologize for the, uh, the dissertation because the dissertation is now 250 pages and the appendix is 300 pages. The 300 pages is the history of IBM, uh, which I lived through. And so there's an interesting proposition. Uh, the question about why I started working on this dissertation in the first place was I got caught in a double bind. Uh, I'm a student at Alta University. Alta University assumes that you're working with a company because if you are Finnish, you're normally fun funded by the Finnish government and you work with companies. That's what they do. And so they want you to write about your companies. But I'm working at IBM. IBM hates navel gazing and they don't want you to write about your company. So I had this problem where one says write about the company, the other says don't write about the company. It's like, ah, oh, 
frozen. So open sourcing is a very interesting opportunity because what I'm doing is actually writing about things that IBM was very public about. A lot of it is newspaper, and I have, but the difference is because I was working at IBM, and I now graduated from IBM, retired from IBM. Uh, when I read something about IBM, Gary and I have this conversation very often. Um, he asks me something about IBM, and I go, no, this is what it means. Because it's not just about the facts, it's about how it's interpreted and how things are going to go together. So starting off with that, um, I've been building emergent theory on what I call open innovation learning. Um, so the advice I had in my dissertation from one of my friends was I need to place where that is. So open innovation learning is a combination of the field that we call distributed innovation. Distributed innovation includes open innovation. Because the idea that Henry Chesborough had, in effect, when you go back to the original open innovation book, was that we shouldn't be restricting all of our product development inside an R&D lab. We should go outside and partner with other companies and develop innovation in an open way. Um, there's also lead user innovation, which is Eric Von Hippel's work at uh, MIT, uh, where you get involved with users because you don't, you don't, if you want to know how people are using the products, then you bring them in and you get involved that way. Uh, there's also an idea of cumulative innovation that fits in, this, in the community that you learn more as you go along. Now, there's also the other side, which is meta-organizational learning. There's an idea of meta-organizational design because as soon as we move from being a single company to being open, you're now trying to figure out how it is you have multiple companies working together. In an open source community, we have both competitors and people that complement us, and they seem to work together in open source communities just fine. They've been doing it for a long time. So that's actually a meta-organizational design. You have the ideas of practices and social learning that come with uh, ATM Wanger communities of practice, these sorts of things. And you have the idea of uh, co-responsive lifelines. Um, in the past year, I've been reading the work of Tim Ingold. Uh, Tim Ingold is an um, uh, ecological anthropologist. He is on YouTube. He has a lot of his lectures all, all, a lot of his lectures on YouTube. And he's very interesting to, uh, to listen to because he uses no visuals. He just gives the presentations, he reads the presentations, um, written beautifully, and then he writes them up as lectures and you can read them afterwards. Um, for the people in the systems community, the reason for my interest is that, uh, is that Tim Ingold is a direct, um, he, he had directly influenced by Gregory Bateson, the anthropologist. So the ecological anthropology of Bateson, which I couldn't really understand, I, I actually had explained to me through Tim Ingold. Um, and there's different ways of looking at it. So uh, one of the simplest examples is that the way you normally draw systems, and most of them have done this, you draw the system and you draw the environment around it. That actually is a problem when you draw it that way because it doesn't take time into account. So the way that Bateson did this and the way that Tim Ingold did it is we imagine lines. And so I'm on a line, Gary's on a line, Taguchi's on a line. We all run through time. We come together in a knot. We're here in a knot all together, and we share these moments together. And then we go apart, and we come back. You see me like 10 times now. We come back every year. And so the knot is still there, but we come back every time with separate threads. And so this idea of co-responding, which is that when I'm listening to you, I'm seeing you nod, it's like, okay, I'm getting through the message. So, so we co-respond, I speed up, I slow down, depending on how people are in the audience. So those are the ideas that came out. Um, from the uh, dissertation is another body of work on service system thinking that I spoke about last year, which involves service science, system thinking, and generative pattern language with Christopher Alexander. And that's actually outside of the dissertation. Um, but I've done it because we've run into this issue about um, being practical about the research work. And so the question is, after you've learned all this about open sourcing and stuff like that, how would you use it in real life? And my answer would be, now I'm starting another project, which is to do generative pattern language. So that's the effort that uh, I've been working on for a long time, years. Um, let's talk about open sourcing. And I'm interested in the word sourcing. 
Um, and, and so the dissertation is split up this way. There's this behavior called private sourcing only, where you only do research and development inside the company. You have open sourcing only, and open sourcing only means that you're only in the open source community. But there's this phenomenon called open sourcing while private sourcing that IBM did, and you can argue Google does this, and a lot of Silicon Valley's do this. How is it they do this? And so I say, look at this as an analogy. And we're going to talk about far about um, <coughs> taking fish. How do we take fish? So private sourcing is like aqua farming. You farm the fish. You give them the water. You give them the food. You have the whole life cycle inside. That is a private sourcing approach to fish. There is the open sourcing approach to fish, which is going out, taking out the boat, and throwing out the nets, or taking the fishing line. And that is all open source because you don't do anything. You just throw in and you take the fish out. But there's a phenomenon called open, uh, ocean ranching. And what they do is that they put, they, they actually will uh, put the egg and the sperm together in the water at, on the river. The salmon go out to the ocean and they swim out in the ocean. They come back in two years and then you catch them when they come back. And that is what open sourcing or private sourcing is. And it's, the reason it's close to the systems community is uh, Tim Allen, uh, when he talks about how you do supply side sustainability, he says, only provide what nature doesn't provide by itself. And so you have to ask, well, why is it that when you're doing aquaculture, you're doing farming, why do you have to provide the water? Doesn't nature already provide water? And why do you have to provide the food? Will nature provide the food for you? So, on the one hand, if you want to control everything, you do private sourcing. On the other hand, if you can actually have a longer view and say, yes, when we put these fish in the river and it goes out, I may lose a few, but I don't have to now have my own ocean. Right? So that is the idea of, of open sourcing while private sourcing. In the data, these are the seven cases, and you can see they start from uh, 2000. Uh, they start off with integrating development, which is the Eclipse project. Uh, microblogging, which microblogging was not a term that was understood. Now everyone knows Twitter. But you're, if you're thinking of like 2000, 2003, someone say, I'm going to do Twitter. It's like, well, I don't know how you're going to do that, and the technology's not available. Uh, blogging was an interesting uh, project. And blogging started off the green, green lines for open sourcing. Blogging started off as open sourcing first, and then IBM actually worked on products that, could, that was private sourcing and sold products on it. Same sort of thing with Wiki. Uh, podcasting. IBM was doing, um, it, had this, it has internally a, a, a library where you can save podcasts. And people were using it because when you have telephone conference calls, you can record the calls, and they automatically get stored in the library so people can play it back. Uh, never become a product. Mashing up was a technology that actually failed uh, because when they released the, when they're ready to release the product in 2008, there's an economic downturn. And so even if you do all the right things, sometimes it doesn't work. Co-authoring, I thought this was going to be, I thought, oh, I've done all these cases, I'll do just one more and be really short. Uh, this is a story of, of a Microsoft Word versus LibreOffice versus OpenOffice, and it became a very long one. Um, but it was interesting because IBM came back, not because they're interested in desktop publishing, desktop word processing, but because they're interested in cloud. So, in effect, IBM was interested in something like Google Docs. Um, and, but it's only interested in business customers, not consumer products, so it came quite differently. But you see that what happens is you have these periods where IBM is working on stuff um, in blue for products by itself, and in green, you have the open source stuff that they're actually contributing and anyone can download for free. Okay, so the second thing I want to talk about, significant Internet of Things, cloud platforms, and cognitive computing initiatives involve commercial and non-commercial contributions. And so just because it's open source doesn't mean it can't be um, commercial. So how many of you have heard of Arduino? Okay, one person, two people. Okay, Arduino is open source hardware. This started in Italy at a, uh, a school that was teaching design. 
And what they wanted was um, the hardware devices, because now we're talking about Internet of Things. Uh, traditionally, we, we work with devices. <coughs> they are, they don't do anything. <laughs> uh, you, as a designer, you want to be able to create a, a, a lapel that flashes lights, or you want a little robot that will move, right? And you want to be able to program that. And the challenge was that the prices were so high that students couldn't do it. So in Italy, the Arduino project was started where they created open source hardware. And it's great for prototyping. And you want to create your own robot? You want to teach the person how to do that? The design of the whole program is to have people building their own hardware. And, you, and, you, and it's, a, it's a crossover from the physical world to the digital world. So this is part of the, of the trend that came out um, uh, a few years ago. IBM presented an Internet of Things demonstration. Um, and this is the ADEPT demonstration uh, with Samsung. And the idea is you have this washing machine. And the washing machine uh, has, will, will monitor and negotiate with consumables. So it keeps track of how much soap is in the machine. When the soap is low, it places the order directly. <coughs> You don't have to do anything. It will place the order for you. Um, energy, it can negotiate the power usage, service. It knows when the warranty is done. All that intelligence is built into the machine. And it's actually pretty straightforward. So this is what Internet of Things could be, where you have machines talking to machines, and they're, they have the capabilities programmed in without having all the human beings intervening with things that they don't matter. Which brings us to the Hyperledger project. How many people heard about the blockchain? Okay. How many people heard of Bitcoin? Okay, so Bitcoin is a ledger. Um, and it is, Bitcoin is oriented towards keeping track of how much one person owes to another person. And they do that in Bitcoin. The, the technology for Bitcoin has gone up and down, and, but it's not the uh, currency that is important. There's an alternative technology called Ethereum, which was done on an open source project. The original author is actually from Toronto. Um, so Toronto, there's a lot of stuff about having Ethereum in Toronto. Um, they, they, they have this project where uh, they would use ledgers in a, in a larger sense. So the idea of a ledger is like you do in bookkeeping, except when it's in virtual space, you can now have multiple copies of it. And what you do is that you don't store the data in just one place, you store it in multiple places. And people who have access to view the data is great. And people that don't have access, they see the transaction exists, but they don't know what's inside that transaction. So this is a project, um, the Hyperledger project, where they've been looking at creating the uh, ultimate ledger for the Internet of Things. And, and people think, oh, that means you're keeping track of money. No, a better example is keeping track of a, something on a ship being shipped from China to the United States. Where is it? How many? So every time it goes through a sensor or a port, it gets logged. And that's a ledger entry. And so you keep track of things. So when we talk about the uh, Internet of Things, people focus on the device. But there is this data that's coming, there's a lot of data. It's like a ledger. This thing moved three miles, you know, and it moved another six miles. It's like, okay, you know, there's just so much data, you don't know what to do with it. But the ledgers are the way of doing that. The Hyperledger project is an open source project with the Apache Foundation. So IBM has contributed to this, there's very, very many other companies have contributed to it. But the idea is to use the blockchain on the Internet of Things. Cloud computing. So we've already seen a slide on cloud computing. Let me try and give you another explanation of what cloud computing is all about. So traditionally, if you were um, running a server in, a, uh, in uh, your company, you would have, have all these things. So we have what's called infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is taking the hardware and virtualizing that into software. So as opposed, like you can't tell now, but most of the time when you're hitting a, a, a server, in that server, you are not hitting a, vert, a, a real physical machine. You are hitting a 
virtual machine. It's software running on top of software that looks like a machine. So this would be, as an example, I want a Linux server, or I want a Microsoft Windows server, or I want a Mac server, except it's not a real server. It's actually software that emulates it. And you ask, well, isn't that kind of efficient, inefficient? Well, no, it isn't, it isn't a, um, inefficient because a lot of the time uh, when you're dealing with hardware, you have to like start the hardware. Like everyone started their PC, right? It, take, it takes a minute or two. A virtual machine, they'll turn it on and off in five seconds. And they'll build a whole machine. So you say, you know, I want, I want this version of Linux, I want the software and all this sort of stuff. And they build it virtually and then they replenish it. And so you say you want the machine, they create the machine for you. Uh, the, this technology has advanced so much, they have what's now called serverless computing. Because there's a lot of power spent on machines that are running hardware that are just waiting there for you to do something. They've actually created this technology so that what it does is that it's off. And then you hit the server, it turns on, loads up the whole machine, runs your request, and then waits like you know 10 seconds to find if anyone else comes along, and then it shuts itself off. Because the time for it to start the machine is so fast that they don't need it. So the serverless, it's kind of like, wow. Oh. So they've, they've, made, they've made machines that are not only virtual, but they turn it on and off by them. Okay, so that infrastructure is a service. Now you can go to the next level, which is to put up middleware and the operating system on top. So at, when you get up to that level of, of what's called platform as a service, um, there's, uh, you can do a programming language. So you do Java, or you do Node.js, you do one of these other programming languages. When you work at infrastructure as a service, this is like actually Amazon Web Services, I have to usually install a Linux server, so now I have Linux running, and then I install Java on top of it, and then I install HTTP server and all stuff. It's like, no, no, we'll do it to the next level. I don't care what's underneath it. I want to run the Scala programming language. So I don't care what operating system it's on. Um, and then you have all the software and server stuff that goes up to the level. So when we're talking about cloud computing, cloud computing is actually taking physical machines and emulating them in software. So it could be that the original, the chip at the very bottom is a, um, is when you want it to be an Intel machine, but actually what they're doing is they're saying, no, it's actually an IBM PowerPC chip, and they're emulating the Microsoft machine and software. That's what they're doing with all this cloud computing. So the, oh, the uh, platform for the service, um, and this is interesting, uh, the foundation that does that, they have an organization called Cloud Foundry. And uh, I've been attending, um, this was done by Pivotal Software, that's a division of um, EMC. And so it's interesting, going to uh, Pivotal in Toronto, <coughs> it's downtown, they have really, it's, you know, it's, it's one of these Silicon Valley type places, you know, one, they have free food, you know, sort of stuff. Um, and so I go there and they give excellent briefings. And it was really funny being there and, and asking, you know, how's the project going? They go, oh yeah, well, you know, Pivotal is contributing like 80% of the resources on this. And, you know, we wish the guys like IBM would do more. And it's like, okay, I can understand that, but IBM contributed $1 billion to Linux. And they're actually working on the second billion dollars for Linux, so you've got a long way to go when you're complaining about you know, resources. So different companies will focus on different parts. Now, the IBM Bluemix product is actually Cloud Foundry. They t IBM takes open source code and takes it and puts it on IBM hardware and runs it, and so they're taking software that's free and they're making money off it. And it's like, wow, that's a really interesting proposition. So, Cloud, cloud, uh, cloud Foundry is one of those platforms. So for people who have not um, heard uh, the IBM message on, on, cloud, on uh, cognitive computing, this is a really good article, a uh, white paper, written by John Kelly. Uh, it's easy to find on the internet. Uh, John Kelly is a VP of research, or was a VP of research, and so the question he was asked is, you know, what is all this cognitive stuff, and how is it different? And so, uh, IBM was positioned different eras. So he talk, they talk about the tabulating era, 
And the tabulating era is adding things up, counting. This is the era of the US Census. Then we have the programming era, where in effect you're doing automation. You're just taking processes, you're making them faster. So bookkeeping faster, um, whatever your transaction processing, it's all stuff we've been thinking about. But then we have the cognitive era, and the cognitive era is a different, different way of thinking about this. Um, the, the, the best reference for this, up at the top, they cite um, Lidlicher and they cite um, the um, person that invented the mouse, Doug Engelbart. Doug Engelbart had this idea of collective intelligence. Um, and he was doing work, um, if you actually search for Doug Engelbart on the web, they have what's called the mother of all demos. And this was the first time a mouse was used. He invented the mouse. He invented the bitmap screen. And so things we take for granted, you know, he was actually trying to find a way to get the collective intelligence of human beings up. And that was with man and machine together. So when, when IBM uses the word cognitive, they don't actually use the word machine learning so much. They're not concerned about machine learning. They're concerned about man and machine together. And so the cognitive era is positioned that way where the programming is fine. The programming, you could actually say, is more machine stuff. But when you're getting into this new cognitive era, you're looking at man and machine. OK, so the ultimate, the ultimate self-driving machine. So what does a self-driving machine actually, a self-driving car actually mean? So there's five, there's, um, five levels. Um, and what happens is that you get to um, level four is at the level at which the um, machine can drive by itself, but you kind of don't do it. You, 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 you just, let it go, but then you really should have human intervention. The idea of getting to level five is a machine that actually drives by itself. So I was fortunate, uh, last week I was visiting my son who's now working at Next EV, and for 2020, he is the lead system engineer on the battery system, uh, the powertrain system um, for Next EV, and he, they're working on a car that is fully autonomous. So you now you have the question about, well, do you need a steering wheel? Why would you need a steering wheel? And, and they're just talking about these sorts of things. And, and he and said, realistically, they're having discussions every day about, OK, it's fully autonomous, which means someone can sleep in the car. What do you do with a car when the battery fails and the car is in motion and the, and the person is sleeping inside? So he's dealing with those issues directly. But he's specifically working on a team for level five. We're now at the level that, again, this question, cognitive, is that man and machine, or is that just machine? And so he gets to deal with these sorts of questions up front in a practical way. Now, all the stuff on open AI, machine learning, all, uh, they, they, there has been this interest in Silicon Valley, and uh, Elon Musk, who founded Tesla, has created this institute called OpenAI. Um, there's two sides to it. One is that industry is so, um, it, it's, it's really early in, in, in working on these new technologies. They, they actually don't know where they're going. And what's happening is they're trying to preclude um, people getting locked in with specific vendors or providers with that provide their own AI technology. So you end up with the question, will Apple's AI be different from everyone else's AI? Um, and this is the sort of thing that they're trying to battle. So there is an open source AI project and there's also the partnership on AI. The partnership in AI is now the technology companies being concerned about the impact of the AI technology. They're actually focused on the social aspects and trying to do this in an open way and have a discussion on it. Okay, so that was about all the technologies. The last idea is creators, makers, and remixers should consciously choose and declare the conditions for the derivative works. We're working in an open source world. Um, do they have the maker movement here in Japan? So 3D printers and they have fairs. So in California, they have what's called the maker fair. And they have people that come together with the Arduino devices. They build things together. Um, and it's a community where they actually make things. Um, it's it's all interesting. When I go to the ones in Finland, they have people that sew. 
Um, they have people that knit. <laughs> because making is an art that is coming back. Um, I hate to, hate to pick on MBAs, but MBAs don't make anything, right? Um, engineers make things, designers make things, you know, so I'm an MBA, incidentally. I come from an era where MBAs were, you know, that when I graduated, nobody knew what an MBA was. Um, so it, it's with a bit of cynicism, but I'm working now um, with design schools rather than working with business schools because it's much more interesting. I'm interested in people that make things. Uh, so it's, it's a, a shift that's happened. Um, and uh, they have the maker movement that, that's come about. Um, have any of you seen the book Remix by Lawrence Lessig? This is a book that's worth looking at uh, because Lawrence Lessig is a lawyer from Harvard. And the question is now around intellectual property and what does it mean when you are going into a world where things are open sourcing. Uh, so he starts off and he describes read-write versus read-only culture. Um, copyright is so pervasive in our society that, uh, so let, let, let's talk, so the, you know, it's so pervasive that in the character set for ASCII, right, all the computer characters, there is a copyright symbol. That's how pervasive it is. What, cop what is copyright really? Copyright says that before I can copy any work that's <coughs> made by someone, I have to go get their permission. Which is like, really? Like, <laughs> so you end up with, okay, fair use, you know, library use of books and these sorts of things. Um, but he calls that read-only culture. Uh, they have, you know, for computers you have read-only and read-write. When you're doing copyright in that way, it is read-only culture. If you have a world where people are encouraged to make derivatives, to change those works in an open source way, you have, they have all the tools, then what you do instead is that you use a Creative Commons license, and what a Creative Commons license says, here are the conditions under which you can use my work. Don't call me. So if you actually go to my website, what my website says, um, it says buy SA, so it's, it, it says I want attribution, so if someone Wants to, wants to cite my work, don't say it's your work, I actually wrote this stuff. It also says non-commercial. So if you're just going to use it and you know, I'm not going to make any money off it, be my guest. But if you're going to publish something, then you come and talk to me and we'll have a separate conversation because I can relicense it again, it's my content. So the remix culture is something that is among the young and among the people who are working in open source communities, it's, a, it's just a way of thinking, and I call that open sourcing. It's a behavior where you're sharing, and you're sharing your, the, not only the end products, but also the ingredients that, that allow you to create the work. So, Flickr. Everyone knows Flickr, right? You have photographs on it? Now, this is really interesting that Flickr, I wrote the sign with no space on it, Flickr was founded in February 2004. In 2000, by June of that year, they had Creative Commons licensing on their website. So for any of you that ever you know, need an image, what you want to do is go to Flickr and you go to the Creative Commons part and you can use the photographs with the condition. So attribution license, someone says, use my, use my work, just let them people know that this is a photograph I took, right? They have attribution, no derivatives. Okay, well, you can use my photograph, but don't edit it. Right? And you go through the various categories, um, non-commercial, no derivative works, these sorts of things. So open sourcing has been around for a while, people don't think about it. Um, now the interesting thing is that if, if you store your photos with Google, and you have an Android phone, you replicate directly, uh, they only put in Creative Commons license in 2009. So they went five years before they did that. Wikipedia, founded in 2001, had a, um, a GFDL. This is a new um, documentation license, free, do free documentation license. And what happened was that Wikipedia was developing a law, but the license actually has some uh, legal things in it, so they actually changed to Creative Commons. Creative Commons um, by share alike. So it means you should attribute it because they will see who actually did the edits. And if you 
actually take that content, you agree to the same rules that someone else did. That's a share alike. Um, so uh, out there, this crossover period. So if you had written content in 2009 and you didn't want the new license, then you could have removed it within that period. But Wikipedia runs this way. How many people have used GitHub? Okay, a few. Um, GitHub was invented by whom? Okay, this is, this is the, the interesting trivia question. Lit, it, Git is a technology that was the number two invention of Linus Torvalds. Linus Torvalds invented Linux. Great. You've got one guy with an operating system. How is it that he manages all the different communities, open source community worldwide, with all these different versions of software? You've got people contributing stuff left and right. How do you keep track of things? How do you do all the version control? And so he created what's called the Git technology. What GitHub has done is they've taken the Git technology and they put a web interface on it. So this is the Git book, um, uh, uh, Git book section. Of, and so Git book is a way to write a book using Git technology, and it is free. It is open source software. Now, if you go to gitbook.com, the, the founders that wrote the software actually make money off it. So I think it's if you, if you, bu if you publish a book um, for free, so you know, like just um, it's completely open source and people can see it, then you, you could do one book for free. If you want to do a private book, they charge you like $5 a month, something like that. So that's how they make money. But if you actually want to have, have your own server and you can do it, you can download the code and do it for free. So the technology um, is there, you can download it. It's got the cloner download button. Um, this is what the website looks like, get book and you know, hosting and stuff like that. So it's a different way of working. On GitHub, they actually state the licenses up front. So there's the MIT license, which is essentially do whatever you want with it. There's the Apache license, which says, um, okay, you can actually do whatever you want with it. You just have to put the license and say where it came from. And you've got the GPL, which is um, if you ever redistribute the, the software, you have to distribute the source code with it. So if you run a computer code and it compiles, you can't just ship the object code. You have to ship the uh, source code with it. So the, the licenses on GitHub are, are there and how people use it. And then this website, which is choosealicense.com. So you know, do you want something that's simple and permissive, which is like, oh, I don't really care. They do the MIT license. If you're concerned about patent and patent protection, use the Apache license. Um, and if you care that for the people who are into democracy that want to make sure that you always have software and it's always free and it's never got a government working against you, you're over in GPL. So these are, and then you have down here, one of these works that work for me, which is generally all the Creative Commons stuff because the licensing is different on that. There's also, now this is the interesting thing, Git is a free technology by Linus Torvalds. The, the code for GitHub is owned by GitHub and copyrighted and private sourced. So you can't run your own GitHub server. However, there is an alternative called GitLab. GitLab is open source, so you can take the, the web software, which is free, you can load it on your own server and you can run it for free. And so what does IBM do? IBM does Cloud Foundry plus GitLab. It's taking more software that's free and selling it to customers. Wow. Some of this is all me. And so I've actually been working on moving websites over because we do GitHub pages. Um, you can actually use their server. So I don't have to provide my own server. Okay. Uh, Ward Cunningham was inventor of the wiki. Not Wikipedia. There's a wiki technology. The history of wiki was it was invented to support the pattern language project when the software development community started working on it. And so this is why I've been interested in it. Now, uh, this is a Wired article that came out in 2012, and Ward Cunningham says, wiki as you know it is not what he had in mind. What he's trying to do is have the GitHub approach, the Git approach, 
where you have multiple branches and you bring things together. You can uh, merge and fork and all this sort of stuff. But the idea is to have people working in parallel at the same time. And so he has um, a federated wiki technology. Um, it looks like this. Um, and if you go to fed.wiki.org, um, you can actually go and uh, uh, edit pages if you can log into it. Uh, but the idea that, that Ward has is that everyone should have their own wiki. And these things are all networked. So what happens is that when you create a, a wiki, uh, if you see one of these pages that I like this page, you press a button, it automatically copies it over onto your wiki, your own. And then it, if you edit it on your page, it creates a flag on the page for, for, for Ward, and Ward knows that someone has done a derivative work. And so when, when that happens, then Ward can now go over and say, oh, Gary edited a version. It's like, either it's like, wow, that's great. I'm going to bring it back into my content. And so then he brings it back, and they get this thing going back and forth with multiple objects working on it. Or it could be, no, that's terrible. And if it's terrible, I'll just leave it. And so I'll have my version. He has his version. And you have the multiple perspectives that you try to do in an inquiring system in the system thinking way. So this will, now, this will allow you to have multiple perspectives. The interesting part I've been wrestling with him about, which I'm not sure we're going to solve, is how do you merge content? So it's like, I, like the, I don't like what Gary's written. We need to have a conversation, right? And that part doesn't go away. You have to actually do that. It's not, you're not going to solve that mechanic. OK, so um, that's my presentation. I covered three ideas. Firstly, was about open innovation learning and what open sourcing and private sourcing are, if they have a sense of that. Um, the second is on the Internet of Technology, Internet of Things, cloud platforms, and cognitive computing. And they're all being done in this open sourcing way. So I was writing, and my history is 2001 to 2011, but it's become so common now. So the, the latest exploit, the latest thing I did was um, my son gave me um, his old phone, a Samsung, no, it's not this phone. Uh, he gave me a Samsung S2, a really old phone. It runs Android 4, right? Well, if you are in the Android community and keeping track, Google does not support Android 4 anymore. There's no more updates. However, they provide the code, the base code, open source for free. And so I went searching on the web. I discovered this uh, community called the uh, Resurrection Remix community that has Android 7 running. And so I loaded the software on. Uh, my wife has been using the phone for a month now. Uh, and she has an Android phone that works on the current level. So I'm like, this phone is really old. So uh, that's sort of thing you can do with the open source when you have commercial and non-commercial people. Um, and finally, I want you all, because everyone here is a creator. Anyone that writes anything or publishes anything is a creator. Um, I encourage you to think about the licensing of your work and telling people, please use my work. Please share and improve on it, because that's the way that innovation will improve. Thank you. Okay. Any comment? Wow. Question? Okay, I have. Okay. <laughs> I actually almost agree with your so agenda, but well, well one of the objections is uh, well, uh, crowd platform. Actually, that means uh, well, as I pointed in my presentation, mm -hmm. maybe so many. A uh, big platform, lock, uh, easy uh, to lock in. So, well, anyway, so platform itself is maybe should be a kind of open platform, yeah. Home, open, uh, maybe, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. infrastructure. Actually, well, that's that's right, that's right. Actually, well, in B two C area, mm -hmm. maybe like Google or Amazon. So many big platform is already locked in. But B two B area, well now yes and past and SaaS concept with uh, maybe DevOps development and operations yeah. uh, approaches started with a microservice. Then maybe now just started the conversion to the big platform. 
So, uh, even for maybe open source platform, the type of convergence now increasing and locking my up. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so, so there, there's a lot happening. Um, and, and so, uh, Linux is a really interesting thing. And so, uh, moving, so I moved on, I haven't used uh, Microsoft Windows uh, on my machine since 2008. Because IBM had a project internally where they said you have a choice of using Windows or you could use Linux. And it's like, well, I'm actually not a fan of Microsoft. So I switched over there. Um, and most recently, uh, so I actually do have a machine that has Windows 7 on it. Tried to upgrade to Windows 10. It wouldn't upgrade. It's like, okay, I threw. I have Windows 7. I'll never go to Windows 10 because they made it so difficult. I've never had problems installing Linux. So uh, if people are starting off new, they should have open platforms. If they are not starting off new, now you have another problem. You have a discussion about how far down you go. Um, if, if you're already based on Linux, then there's no problem. If you're based on uh, Windows or on Mac OS, now you have to stop and think, could I actually take the software and run platform as a service? Because if you're running Java, or you're, you know, you don't care what operating system's running under you, you're running Java. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, so a, a quick question about concerns about security. Mm -hmm. You know, huge concerns for people at all kinds of levels. Yeah. So when you've got this whole matrix of the different parts, which, which parts are the most important relative to security. It's not strictly open source or... Oh, uh, no, they are open source. And so there's a philosophical thing that goes on in the open source community. Mm -hmm. The, um, was it the Heartbleed one? So, so yeah. what happens is that there was an SSL encryption that it was open source code that all the companies were using and no one was paying for. And then they, then they found out there was a bug in it. And it's like, okay, so now it's like, you want to give us some money so that we'll fix it? But the way we're going to fix it is we're going to fix it out in the open so that everyone knows how it works. Because if Microsoft or Apple has a bug in it, like, is it a bug? Is it your problem? Is it their problem? You can't tell because it's not transparent. So there's this phrase called um, uh, to... Um, to all, uh, yeah, all, all bugs are shallow to more eyes. Um, and so you, you end up with this question now about whether it's better to be transparent on the open source code so you can see everything and everyone can see it. And when someone says there's an error here, it's like, oh, we didn't know that. We should probably fix it. So when it, it's a different attitude. Um, there's a cartoon that's, uh, that has on the left side Microsoft Windows <laughs> update, there it goes, oh no, not again. But on the other side, you have the Linux update, and it's like, well actually, they must have fixed something, you know, and it doesn't cause things to break, they test it pretty well, so I don't have a problem with it. So there, there's a philosophical difference. They, and, and this is why open sourcing is not about technology. Because in science, we do this. In science, we should have data and, and methods that could be replicated. Right? And it's tougher in the social sciences. Physical science is pretty straightforward. But that's the way science has always been. So how would you feel with a scientific experiment where the guys say, oh yeah, trust me. <laughs> I, you know, I have the data, just trust me. It's like, no, no, this doesn't quite work. Okay. Okay, last one. Well, um, I understand your today's uh, presentation is uh, it's based on your uh, dissertation. Uh, the first part is, the second part is not. Uh, okay, uh, this, uh, the third part is, uh, is completely uh, independent. It uh, well, it's related. It's because it is about open sourcing. And so, um, um, do you have a question that's associated with it? <laughs> kind of, because, because I mean, um, to, to, um, to, um, to, to understand your presentation um, as a systemic core, I, I, I have a a bit of uh, confusion because um, your um, position sounds uh, like a big book uh, with a, a huge survey, so to speak, but, but I can't quite see um, what 
you, I mean, you as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, how do you show you something new as a researcher, uh, what, what is your, your So, so, so the, there are a couple of premises that are challenged, and so Gary brought one out, which is, what happens, why, why do we have secrets? And, and people think, the more secrets, the better, and it's like, well, not really. Um, if you're actually transparent and people can see, then there are benefits to a larger community. So secrets are maintained and they benefit the people that maintain the secrets. They don't benefit us, right? The, the other part that is, is very significant is that um, in business, there's this belief in competitive advantage and that you have to be secret. And the answer is, no, they, no, IBM was very profitable, like the, from 2001 to 2011 was the Palmozano years. The stock went up, like $80 to 260 I think. And so to say that you can't have a business model based off open source and being commercial, that's not true. Mm. Um, and it, it's an interesting discussion, like, as I get in back into commercial businesses, because because people now go say to me, um, why would you do this? It's like, so I've been looking at some open source project, I think we should use this code. And they're going, but that's someone else's code. And I say, yeah, it's free. And that doesn't mean that we can just take the code and not ever do anything with it, because if something breaks, we have to fix it, and then we give it back to the community. So it's not just taking, it's also giving at the same time. Hmm. So, um, it's, okay, it's time. Oh, right. <laughs> At the last presentation, uh, Professor Kijima 